Our next challenge is replicating the end of the chromosomes. So as our eukaryotic chromosomes extend uh, and replication bubbles begin to merge, you're left with uh, one end being replicated all the way to the end, all the way to the three prime end. And on the other end, we are left with a primer. Now uh, on the lagging strand, you're going to fill in all of your Okazaki fragments where your RNA primer was and ligate your sections together. But no matter what happens, you're going to be left with an RNA primer on each of the five prime ends of one of the sides of each of your daughter strands. So we have to get rid of that RNA. So we have an option here of just saying, well, we're just going to remove this RNA and then this DNA gets degraded. The problem with that is we're going to lose genetic information. And every time you replicate this molecule, you lose a little bit. If you lose too much, you actually get into coding region and you don't want to lose your coding information. But we have to take off this RNA primer because we need a DNA molecule. We can't leave RNA in there. And so we are left with this gap on the end. So remember that telomeres are the ends of the chromosome. The telomere region of the chromosome contains um, a section of repeats, thousands of short repeats of one sequence. Now the reason is that this sort of makes a buffer so that the ends of the telomeres, um, even if they are lost, don't uh, degrade into coding sequence. But we actually have an enzyme that can take care of this problem. That enzyme is called telomerase, and telomerase's job is to replicate the ends of the chromosome, essentially to add back some additional repeats on the end. So telomerase works by first extending the ends of the chromosome, and then it sort of, in this process, makes a gap that can be filled in with DNA, essentially extending past where that RNA primer was and filling it in with DNA. So let's talk about how this actually works, how telomerase actually does this. So I'm going to draw just the general idea on top here uh, before I talk about the specifics. So your enzyme is going to come in and it's going to make an RNA, you know, still with the RNA, an RNA sequence here hanging off the end of your DNA. Now some of it's going to overlap with the end of your sequence. Don't worry about that gap for now. Now telomerase is an enzyme that is a reverse transcriptase. So reverse transcriptase makes DNA from RNA. And we haven't done that one yet, um, but you can use RNA as a template to make DNA. And so that's what's going to happen here. This reverse transcriptase, this telomerase molecule, is going to then use the RNA as a template to extend that DNA. And then another telomerase molecule can come along and extend it a little bit more. So down here, we have a picture of our telomerase. So that's essentially uh, what it's doing, is adding sections of our DNA uh, extending our DNA section. And it can do this because the telomere is a repeating region, same region repeats over and over and over again. So it's just basically adding repeats to the end. So we can see here we've added our new strand. And then after that, we get another DNA polymerase that comes in and sort of backfills our DNA molecule. And so if this was the region here that was the original end of our DNA, we've actually filled out past that region. So when telomerase comes in and extends it, we are still left with that RNA primer region. Um, but 
it's okay because if we remove this RNA, the cell could degrade this part because it's a single-stranded piece of DNA without that RNA primer, but we're never entering our coding region. Now the same process is gonna happen over here on our other strand on the opposite end. Telomerase is gonna come in there, fill in our gap. So both of our strands are going to be fixed up. So we just went through this process of how telomerase works and why we need um, to fill it in so that we don't lose part of our DNA molecule. Um, telomerase is um, highly conserved throughout evolution. That means um, it hasn't changed. Um, and usually when things are highly conserved, it means they're really, really important. So this is super important. Um, we don't want to degrade our coding DNA, but actually not all adult cells have telomerase. Only some of them do, and it's only those that divide frequently. Um, and the reason for this is that the telomerase, although they are blocking degradation on one end, they're also sort of acting as um, a regulation for cell division. So um, as you have cells that don't have telomerase and they lose, they begin to lose ends of their DNA, it actually limits the number of cell divisions that can happen because every time your cell divides, you replicate your DNA. And if you lose a little bit, you get to a point where the cell is going to uh, enter that coding region. So that put, sort of puts a lifespan on our cells. And in fact, um, the loss of telomeres has been correlated with aging. Um, and you start to see a, a slowdown in cell division in certain tissues. Um, something that's interesting about this is that more than 80% of cancer cells have active telomerase. Now that makes sense because cancer is uncontrolled cell division. And the reason that these cells can continue dividing is that they have a telomerase mechanism that maintains those telomeres and allows them to continue dividing even past their normal life. So let's move on to the accuracy of DNA replication. So I've said a few times that the replication process is actually pretty good. Um, there's not a lot of errors produced in one round of DNA replication, but sometimes errors do occur. Um, replication is not perfect and occasionally um, errors are passed on. Now those errors actually are important sometimes for genetic variation. And in fact, this variation in DNA sequence that arises from mut mutation is the only source of new variation in a population. And so that variation can then affect differential survival and therefore evolution. So having errors in this replication process is not necessarily a bad thing. On the flip side of that, if an organism is already adapted and a change occurs, it's probably not going to be a good thing for that organism. And then on top of that, environmental factors can also cause damage or errors in our DNA. So um, we're kind of going to lump these two problems together into the replication process because the repair process is similar for both. But since we're actually talking about uh, replication, we're going to talk about how we fix errors due to re replication. So DNA polymerase is not perfect, and sometimes you get a wrong base pair match. Um, DNA polymerase can actually recognize when it mismatches, uh, back up, and put in the new base. So as it's moving along, DNA polymerase 3 um, can actually, I'm sorry, not DNA polymerase 3, um, DNA polymerase in eukaryotes can actually back up, insert the correct uh, DNA base pair, and then move on. Unfortunately, sometimes you still get errors that uh, escape. One reason that you can actually have these base pairs uh, incorrect 
base pairs is something called a tautomer. So a tautomer is an alternate form of the same molecule. So generally, I'm going to skip down to the middle of this uh, diagram here. Generally, we have A and T binding and C and G binding. But actually, some of the functional groups on these molecules can actually uh, sort of move or flip. You can exchange some atoms occasionally, and that changes the structure of our molecule. So if we move at hydrogen, we now have a different functional group here and no functional group off of our nitrogen. And so that changes the number of bonds or the way that that can bond with other molecules. And now all of our four can form tautomers. So when that happens, you can get something like an adenine making two bonds with a cytosine or a thymine making three bonds with a guanine. Now this is rare, but it does happen. So the solution for this um, is, or there are actually several solutions. Um, one is cellular checkpoints within the cell division process. Um, and then we also have proofreading abilities. And uh, then we'll talk about a few other mechanisms in a few minutes, a few other ways that we can actually uh, correct sequence problems. So the first one, before DNA replication even starts, there are cellular checkpoints. And we will talk about these when we get to the process of cell division. But these are essentially steps built into um, the overall life cycle of the cell that ensures that DNA is correctly replicated. So these are um, sort of checklists that the cell goes through and won't let the cell into the next uh, phase of cell division until all the DNA is correctly uh, replicated, all the chromosomes are pulled apart, apart properly. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, but the main thing that happens is proofreading. So we said that polymerase can go in and uh, fix mistakes immediately. Um, and it does this by looking for some particular characteristics about the mismatched pair. When it finds a mismatched pair, it can remove it and then insert the correct base. Now this is because DNA polymerase has something called three prime exonuclease activity. That means that it can actually um, basically work backwards. Exo means take it off. So take off the three prime nucleotide. So it can remove that G, remove that T back up, and then uh, go back and continue along its merry way. Um, so Checkpoints within cell division. Um, as I said, cells can sort of survey the DNA for damage um, and then activate processes that um, basically pause the cell division cycle until that damage can be repaired. And if that damage cannot be repaired, if the DNA cannot be repaired or um, if more damage accumulates, then the cell will actually undergo what we call apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So in this diagram here, we've got DNA replicated. There's some errors um, at one of our cellular checkpoints that those errors are caught. If the damage is repaired, then the cell just continues on and divides like normal. If the damage is too extensive and it accumulates, then that cell is going to be deemed inviable and the cell will die because the cell um, is not, it's detrimental to the organism to continue to pass on mutations um, or other errors in the DNA molecule. Mismatch repair can also occur after the DNA replication process is finished. So let's say that this strand has undergone replication and polymerase has moved off, it's gone farther down, or it's completely finished. 
Um, the cell can still detect the presence of those incorrect base pairings. And then the same sort of thing happens. Um, an enzyme will come in, identify the region that needs to be repaired. This might be one, it might be a couple of bases. Remove a section and then fill it in. Uh, basically, like you would fill in an Okazaki fragment. DNA polymerase comes in and then ligase seals up the spaces in between. Now, one question you might have is how does the cell know which one is the correct strand? Uh, how does it know that the G is the correct base and the T is the mistake? The answer lies in something called DNA modifications. So after DNA is produced, um, the cell starts to modify a little bit. And we'll talk about some of these modifications a little bit later. But one of the ways that modifications are made is by methylating an adenine. Or the process of methylation. That adds a CH3 functional group. Now these sort of act like molecular tags. So the parent strand is already gonna have these tags, whereas the daughter strand isn't going to be tagged yet. And so the cell can identify which strand is the correct template by the presence of these methylated tags. And so then it knows that it needs to use the methylated strand as the template to repair the mismatch. And so then we end up with the correct base pair there. Uh, so there are several other types of uh, problems that can occur in DNA. Um, these are not necessarily um, base pair changes per se, but they are sort of physical changes that can happen um, to the DNA molecule. Um, you can have methylation of bases. So I just said that um, the cell will actually tag the parent strand. Uh, methylation can occur for other reasons. Um, so that can happen. You can also have um, a break in the backbone. Um, you can have extensive damage or changes to multiple base pairs. And then you can also have double-stranded DNA breaks. So you can imagine that a double-stranded break is a problem. Um, if you have a, a break in the sugar phosphate backbone, um, the cell will go in, take out uh, the, the base pairs that are involved in the broken bond, and then uh, put in new ones. So similar to that mismatch repair. Um, same thing if you have multiple ad adjacent mispaired bases or extensive damage, um, the cell will take out during the process similar to mismatch pair repair again cell will take out the bases that need to be removed and then the whole piece will be filled in with dna polymerase and dna ligase in the case of a double stranded break the cell is going to attempt to stick that broken dna somewhere um, you can imagine that this could be a problem if it's not stuck back in the correct place um, but sometimes it's hard for the cell to figure out where and so it just sticks it somewhere, which is generally not a good thing. We'll talk about that later in the semester. Uh, UV damage is a big uh, problem. Um, UV damage can cause things like skin cancer. Um, and But UV damage causes some very specific changes. And one of the things that it does is causes uh, what we call a thymine dimer. So if UV radiation hits, makes its way down to the DNA, it can actually cause the bonds to break between the adenines and the thymines and form what we call a thymine dimer. This thymine um, is going to bond with itself. So di means two. We have this pair of molecules bound together. So this is repaired by something called photoreactivation. And this is an enzyme that is activated by light. This enzyme is called photolase. And photolase recognizes this dimer and essentially uh, breaks the bond here and reforms the bond 
with the adenines. So that sort of damage can be repaired. Uh, so there are different types of mutations that can take place. I'm just going to talk about this real quickly. Um, I'm more worried about you knowing that they can happen than um, necessarily, you know, than knowing specifically what they're called. Um, but one is a transition. This is where a uh, pyrimidine is replaced with a pyrimidine. So a cytosine is replaced, sorry, a thymine is replaced with a thymine or vice versa. Or a pyrimidine, sorry, a purine is replaced by a purine. So adenine and a guanine gets swapped. Um, we can also have a transversion. In a transversion, you get a purine and a pyrimidine swap. Um, and this is problems. This is going to um, distort the double helix because if you remember, let's go back here. There's a picture here. Um, our guanine and our adenine are two rings wide and our cytosine and our thymine are only one. And so if you get an adenine and a guanine together, you actually get a bulge in your molecule your DNA molecule, where that region is just a little bit wider. Or you get a pinch if you swap a uh, cytosine, I'm sorry, a the opposite swap, the other purine for a pyrimidine. You actually get sort of a waistline in your molecule. So mutations do not just affect the sequence. Remember, we're ultimately trying to express our protein. So um, when you have a mutation, you're going in your DNA, you're going to ultimately affect your amino acid sequence. So I believe that I have already talked about this, um, the types of mutations that you can have. Um, if you have a transition that changes your uh, one of your base pairs, uh, you might produce a missense. Remember, a missense is where you change your amino acid. Now the effect that this has on the protein depends on um, what amino acid you change to and the particular um, properties of the R groups. Sometimes they can cause a big change, other times not so much. It really just depends on if you change the structure and the physical properties of the protein. Um, but you can also in, uh, replace or make a change, excuse me, that causes a stop codon. Now remember, this is a nonsense mutation and it's going to terminate your protein prematurely. So you're gonna lose part of your protein and that of course is going to affect how your protein works. So we'll talk about a little bit later how we actually know uh, what the codes are and what amino acids are coded by them.